Today, of course, is the, uh, is the semester meeting of the University Council. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jim Machorek, and it's my privilege to serve as the chair of the University Senate. Um, and as is the usual procedure in these, in these matters, um, both the president and the chair of the Senate co-chair this meeting, but it's uh, my honor to actually be able to introduce the president who's going to be giving the state of the university address. So without further ado, I give you President Robert Kelly. Well, thank you, and uh, Chairman Mathuk Majorik, thank you as well. I'm a little reluctant to uh, follow such a sartorially splendid display this afternoon. Well, thanks again to all of you for taking a few minutes out of your, your professional day today to uh, catch up a bit with where we are here at the University of North Dakota. I always look forward to any opportunity that I have as your president to uh, speak to you about the many, many merits of this exceptional university. And I think that it provides all of us an opportunity uh, to reflect for a little bit on the successes that all of you achieve, uh, the challenges that impact our university uh, as we all move forward together governing this exceptional place. And I first want to thank all of you, all of our faculty and staff, uh, for the very daily contributions that I know that all of you make uh, to this university, to our mission. And that mission is really very simple, providing the very best teaching and the very best learning opportunities that we can possibly provide to our students, both undergraduate and graduate. This semester, there are 15,250 students enrolled at the University of North Dakota. This is an all-time record. Uh, these individuals come from every state of the United States. Uh, they come from some 50 foreign countries. They have an ACT composite score of 23.5, an average high school GPA of 3.33. I'm very pleased to report that graduate enrollment is up 5%, 2,800 students enrolled in our graduate program. Let me digress for just a moment and say that as we continue to aspire to greater and greater achievement, one achievement could be indexed by being considered seriously by the Association of American Universities. It will be this point, our graduate education, our production of doctorates, and our research intensiveness that will garner that attention from the AAU. I think because of our enrollments, I can safely say that the reputation of our university is very, very solid. Solid from an academic perspective, solid from a value proposition perspective. We are truly making progress to developing exceptional educational credentials as a university. Also contributing to the reputation of the university uh, is the commitment to teaching that I mentioned, uh, the commitment to learning demonstrated by all of you, faculty and staff. We have over 800 professors, nearly 1,000 professional and scientific staff, and over 1,000 general staff, all of whom deliver outstanding programs and contribute to over 225 fields of study for our students. This year, the university welcomed 36 new faculty members. We said goodbye and Godspeed to 31 individuals who either retired or moved to other career opportunities. We also welcomed new staff members, uh, said Godspeed to others, and uh, I'd like to just ask one of our newest staff members to stand up. Where did Eric go, our new police chief? Eric? Just want to say thanks to everyone who contributes to the success of our university. There are some groups that we never really thank very effectively, and I'd like to say thanks to all of the volunteers who contribute their time to help our university succeed in its mission. Uh, these individuals partner with UND in, in a variety of ways. Uh, they teach in virtually every college, every department. They assist staff with a variety of outreach programs. 
They volunteer to mentor students. They provide invaluable assistance to our various activities, including social events, athletic competitions. They provide professional services in our community as they associate and partner and volunteer with the university. I want to especially recognize one somewhat outstanding university volunteer, and that's UND's First Lady, Marcia Kelly. She is an unpaid volunteer. One recent activity is recently partnering with Vice President Laurie Reeser, UND Office of University Relations, Susan Walton's operation, Lee Janot and his UND American Indian Student Services Program, the Alumni Association Foundation Director, Tim O'Keefe, in honoring our distinguished Native alumni here at UND. The annual More Than Beads and Feathers program acknowledged the outstanding achievements, highlighted the individual personal achievements of some of the exceptional graduates of this exceptional university. So I want to say thanks to all of the university partners using this as an example for how we all work together to build an exceptional university. And while I'm sort of in this phase of my thoughts, I want to also thank all of the faculty, staff, and students who play such a pivotal role in sharing the governance of UND with me and my staff. Uh, we are making a very concerted effort to address policies and procedures together. And I want to thank Professor Machorek, uh, the University Senate, uh, the Staff Senate, and the Student Senate for working with all of us as we develop these policies and procedures that guide the university through its day-to-day -day activities. For the next several minutes, I want to focus on the five strategic initiatives. You see them behind me here in our exceptional UND plan. These initiatives form the foundation of virtually everything that we do. I want to commend the individuals in the office of the Provost, Vice President for Academic Affairs, specifically Steve Light, and the Office of Student Affairs for providing a great deal of leadership on a day-to-day -day basis in the achievement of many of the activities now that I'm going to mention, just in highlighting progress, the state of our university relative to these five initiatives. And you can see them, you can read them. Uh, enriching the student experience, facilitating collaboration, encouraging gathering, which is what we're doing, and I'm gonna comment on that in just a minute. Expanding UND's presence and enhancing the quality of life for our faculty and for our staff. We talk a little bit about enriching the student experience. We are constantly innovating on this campus as it relates to our students' educational opportunities. And there are several things that are new this year. We are initiating a first-year experience program. This involves a series of new seminars for entering undergraduates. It provides opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer learning as part of their program here at UND. And it involves a great deal of experiential learning not just sitting in front of a professor, but trying to get out into communities, trying to get into laboratories, experiencing what it means to solve problems from a very, very focused uh, direction. Another new initiative on our campus is expanding the living learning communities. Uh, this year, we have initiated a living learning community for aviation. We have a College of Engineering and Mines collaboration with, engineer with uh, aviation. And these join the standing living learning communities in wellness and honors. And we're continuing to expand those opportunities for our students. We are putting an intense initiative behind undergraduate research opportunities, working through the Office of Research and Economic Development, uh, Phyllis Johnson's operation with, uh, with Barry. We are pushing very, very hard to provide increased opportunities for students to work in laboratories, field work, archaeology, anthropology, all of the kinds of things that our students can get engaged in to enhance their undergraduate learning opportunities. We have some new degree programs on campus. I'll mention one. This is petroleum engineering. We've been working for many years to provide the funding necessary to take on a new sophisticated program leading to a bachelor's degree in petroleum engineering. We've reached the resource base where we can now have a credible program there and we have new students now enrolled in that department. I'd like to say just a couple of words about our North Dakota University system and some of the initiatives that are affecting the University of North Dakota going forward. As all of you know, we have a new chancellor, Dr. Amit Shirvani. 
Dr. Shivani has come in and has established for us a very forward-looking, forward-reaching program that will impact our university and our students. There are two areas that we are working on currently very, very hard. I mentioned an aspiration a moment ago, AAU. For us to be moving towards that direction in time as we join colleagues at the University of Iowa, the University of Kansas, it's an aspiration that we might want to fulfill someday, but it's an invitational thing that we will have to work for. In order to get there, we need to have a quality program, high quality students, and to do that, we may initiate a slightly increased entrance requirement into the University of North Dakota over time. This would mean that even though we have entrance requirements now, they would be somewhat elevated in the new Pathway to Student Success Plan. There is a second piece of this which would combine tuition and fees in a new structure that would establish a differential mechanism whereby a student would be coming in, perhaps undifferentiated at first, but once they assign themselves to a major, that major may carry a slightly different tuition and fee structure than, say, another major that is less costly or more costly. So we are currently working on this, this piece of the new chancellor's plan, the pathway for student success, as we move forward into the coming year. Now this will not be hitting us necessarily in 2013, a year from now, but it will certainly start having a modest impact in 2014 and then successively greater impacts uh, in the years to come. As we participate in the NDUS, the university system, this will also give us opportunities for establishing somewhat more effective enrollment management across the university system. Some students may be counseled to enter another institution within the university system instead of automatically considering one of the research universities. So there will be an increased requirement for enrollment management across the entire system. And we are certainly working with the State Board of Higher Education and the North Dakota University System on working through all of the pieces of this new complex equation. There's a second piece of this this afternoon just to share with you some of the things that we're doing in facilitating collaboration. I was impressed the other evening. I, I, I know that many of you were there but we had a wonderful musical performance that included in the, the city's high schools. Uh, consolidating all of the ensembles with the university ensemble was really quite a treat just to listen to. Collaboration around creation of music. I recently uh, met with one of our colleagues here and was updated on the uh, new patents on biofuels. And I was uh, talking about the uh, very, very close collaboration between chemical engineering and the Energy and Environmental Research Center, which has a world-class reputation on biofuels. So it's fun to watch these con collaborations come together with the creation of new products, new ideas, new intellectual property, and we are succeeding very, very well in facilitating collaborations of that nature. One of the very exciting collaborations has to do with our very famous now under unmanned uh, aviation system research and development. And here's where some of our faculty are partnering between the two research universities, us and NDSU. Uh, when you look at this, we are partnering not only with those institutions, but with the Aperio Systems business down there, uh, trying to work on new uh, sense and avoid technologies that will go on these remotely piloted vehicles as we try to get them more and more into uh, integrated US airspace. Another exciting collaboration in the research area. Not too long ago, I was introduced to the uh, work product of the Digital Humanities Group here on campus. And it's exciting to see the collaboration between computer science and the paradigms behind computer science, how it impacts art and music and archival storage within the Chester Fritz Library. And if any of you get the chance to have any kind of a demonstration of what's being done with the digital, in the Digital Humanities Group, you're going to see three, four, maybe five institutional departments collaborating in a, in a most unique, innovative way. 
I can go on and on about collaborations. We are definitely succeeding here. The health of the public programs, partnering between the School of Nursing, our Rural Health Center, our School of Medicine and Health Sciences, providing outreach into our communities to help with public health. And we have a new master's in public health partnering with the pharmacy program and statistics program at NDSU. And we have all manner of collaboration, not only in the sciences, but in the humanities and the fundamental liberal arts going on across our campus. It's an exciting time and an exciting time to look forward here at the University of North Dakota. Might also mention that we collaborate with the university system. If you haven't been over on the west side of campus behind Ryan Hall, where you'll see a big hole in the ground, that is our new IT facility being built. And if you get a chance to go by some of the older buildings over here in the facilities plant area, you'll see that there's going to be considerable renovation to hold the new data center hardware that will be uh, managed by the people that live in the new IT building uh, behind Ryan Hall. Let me talk about encouraging gathering for just a moment. We've come together for a purpose this afternoon, but wow, what a place for us to gather in. This is the new Goretzky Alumni Center. I hope all of you have had a chance to get back and walk through the building, go up into the upper floors. This is the entryway for our students now into campus. Dr. Reeser and her admissions group is now housed back here behind the stairwell on this floor. And as families come in to get information about the university, what better place to get it than the welcoming center of the Alumni Association Foundation. This is the beginning of a student's career here at the university, and it will be where they end, not their careers, but they will end their academic performance and continue on with the university through the activities as alumni. This is going to be a lead leadership in environmental and energy design. I believe that's what LEAD stands for. This is going to have the highest ranking, the platinum ranking of all of the rankings that LEAD provides. And as you can see, if you walk through the building, there is natural lighting on virtually every floor all the way into the center of the building. This is energy efficient, it's energy sustainable. And this gets at one of the principal issues of our students today of how do we conserve and sustain not only our environment, but that the resources that uh, are contained in that environment. And this building, I believe, is going to become a laboratory for our students and a showpiece for our faculty and our alumni in showcasing how this university is committed to environmental and energy sustainability. There are so many things that I can talk about in updating you on the activities of the university. Um, there are so many gathering opportunities for our students, some of them sponsored by student government, some off, uh, through the Office of Student Affairs. We have activities almost weekly in the performing arts, our theater department, our music department, our art and design department, offering us opportunities to come together faculty lectures, community lectures, athletic competitions, all of these provide us with an opportunity to gather as a member of the UND community. Well, how are we expanding our presence around our city, our state, and our region, our nation for that matter? Uh, there are several ways. I'm going to show you a video here in just a moment of how we have expanded the UND art collections into our community. But I'd like to introduce to you an idea that is currently in the just conversation phase, but you will see a portion of this in our budget presentation here in just a minute. We are thinking about the pieces of putting together what for better term might be a UND branch campus that would be discipline specific, primarily to petroleum engineering in the western part of the state. We have initial plans through the academic uh, faculties and staff over at the uh, uh, College of Engineering and Mines that would start to lay out the groundwork for the academic presence for specific petroleum engineering features to help educate individuals who want bachelor's degrees in that discipline in the western part of the state. We will be partnering in some fashion with Williston State College and uh, I hope that you'll stay tuned as we develop more and more of the, uh, the pieces of that, assuming that there will be some funding coming forward from our legislative session. Other ways that we have extended our presence around the state and the nation have to do with OLLI, our Usher Lifelong Learning Institute. 
I want to thank Lynette Kronelka for taking such an active role in providing opportunities for continued learning with our 50 and over group around the state. Very, very popular program. I had a moment to visit the uh, career fair the other day where we had some 80 businesses participating with the university in educating some 11,000 high school sophomores on career opportunities that can be provided through the University of North Dakota and these other entities. Let me show you a video here for just a minute that I think will uh, kind of interest you. If you had a chance yet to get down to see the art collections at the Empire Theater, uh, you'll know what this video shows you. But if you haven't, this is just a little teaser of how UND is getting out into the community. Art conjures specific words to the mind. Showcase, display, appreciation. Brian Fricke is working to take art from a hidden point A to a very public point B. It's not just in a textbook anymore. Now it's actually real life, I'm part of it. One particular piece has Brian taking special care. I am a big man with little white gloves. Kid gloves for a kid's toy. A kid's toy with a story. A journey that started nearly a century ago in a Native American family and ended up in a cardboard box. Much of this doll's history is unknown. I have thought of it a few times, how many kids played with it, what had happened, where, where it's been. I think of, I have kids, what they do with their dolls. Um, was it the same uh, reactions that they had? You know, whose, whose treasure was this? That relationship between a doll and a child can be precious. Usually a name is the first thing a youngster gives their new companion. This doll was found, but some details remain lost. If it actually has a name, I don't know of it. So um, I know it is one of the dolls in um, a highly prized uh, object here at the university. And so this nameless prized plaything is going to a new home. It's in good company. Art created by the likes of Andy Warhol, Salvador Dali, and Roy Lichtenstein are moving from the repository on the University of North Dakota's campus to a downtown destination. All parties worked to see how it could be done, didn't spend any time seeing how it couldn't be done. It was also my intent to give a hint of the wide range of things that are found in the magnificent collections of the University and the University Foundation. I hope you will enjoy what you see. This art collection has not been seen in its entirety for many, many years, if ever. This is just one way of trying to bring us all, unify us, bring us all together, and also offer some of the resources of the university to the broader community. A unification that brings art where it should be, enjoyed by many. And if only our nameless doll had a mouth to tell of the tale of how it came to be and who cared for it so many years ago how it's made it from a case to a box, through transit to get down here, and now is in uh, a place of honor. Perhaps the name is unimportant. Better unnamed and found than known and hidden away. Well, I certainly have to thank Art Jones and Brian Fricke for the exceptionally good work in providing uh, this form of connection with our community, this reaching out into our community. And it segues very nicely into just the last point that I want to make here regarding our five initiatives, and that has to do with our quality of life. 
We live in an exceptional community, and it's wonderful to have so many university partnerships that we can enjoy as faculty, staff, and students. We have cultural benefits galore here on this campus. You just saw an evidence of one that reaches out into our community. We can go to concerts, lectures, presentations sponsored by any of a number of university groups, athletic events, competitions, virtually every weekend. Uh, this is a remarkable and exceptional community in which to live. We have a new partner in the Choice Wellness Center where we're going to be playing UND tennis. So we have just, just remarkable opportunities for not only connecting with our communities, but with uh, enhancing the quality of our lives here as faculty and staff. I'm not a big one on rankings because I sort of know how these rankings are uh, developed. I have to say one though, because it impacts our uh, nutrition group and some of our campus catering activities. We were re recently listed on greatest.com as the third healthiest university in the nation. So um, take it for what it's worth, but at least we have some uh, connection to uh, health uh, and our partners with the Choice Wellness Center. Let me move off in a slightly different direction now. I, th I think you can see that we're making great progress with our strategic initiatives. It's fun getting there. We all can take great satisfaction in our achievements and the accomplishments of our faculty, staff, and our students as we connect these strategic initiatives in our exceptional UND plan. One of the things that's very important for our campus, though, has to do with leadership development. Individuals have a variety of different ambitions, different abilities, and we need them all to advance this university. We need exceptional teaching, exceptional research, exceptional service, and we need exceptional leadership for us to achieve and aspire to the greatness that we know that we can, we can achieve. In that regard, uh, a number of activities have been initiated, not only for faculty, but also for staff. And just to list a few, the other day, just a week or two ago, I met with a, a cohort of the Chairs Leadership Initiative, uh, talking about how chairs can consolidate their activities working together to get some experience to moving into deanships and beyond. We have a University Governance 101 cohort among our faculty. This is intended mostly for junior faculty to start getting more and more acquainted with institutional government, governance and uh, leadership in that governance. We also have a mid-career faculty development um, cohort working on, on similar leadership initiatives. We have a scholarship of teaching and learning initiative ongoing this, uh, this semester. It's a partnership between the Vice President for Research and Economic Development and the Office for Instructional Development. I would urge all faculty to show interest and gain some experience in participating in some of these cohorts to develop additional leadership skills. I want to thank Trish Young. Um, Trish has just done some great things with our staff senate and our staff group in, uh, in leadership. Uh, she has uh, been stressing the integrated knowledge of staff for our entire campus and has put together groups to uh, help improve communication, cooperation, supervisory skills for individuals in our staff who also wish to uh, move up the uh, leadership ladder within the institution. Let me move to another topic here and discuss with you a little bit the uh, 2013 budget. And I'll talk a little bit about the budget that we're currently in here in the last year uh, of the biennium. We're going to be working with revenues this uh, biennium of about $415 million. Now, if you have not had a chance to look at this publication online, I would strongly urge that you thumb through this. There is more information here that you should know that relates to the state of our university that I could probably tell you in the next many, many hours. Alice Brecky and her office uh, puts this together every year, and it's a compendium of the value, financial value of this university, what our expenditures will be and where the revenues come from for those expenditures. Just very, very quickly, of that $415 million in uh, revenues, a little less than a fourth of it will come from our state appropriation. A little more than a fourth of it will come from tuition and fees. So you can begin to see from the standpoint of expenditures, half of our revenue structure comes from our state and for what we charge our students 
for the opportunities of learning here at UND. Slightly more than a fourth of our revenues come from grants and contracts. I'm gonna make a point about this in just a minute, but just sort of remember that another fourth comes from grants and contracts, and the remaining fourth, roughly, comes from the auxiliary businesses, our residence halls, our laundries, all of the other things that we deal with on campus that generate revenue that help us pay the bills for operations here at the university. One of the challenges that concerns all of us, should concern all of us, has to do with the federal budget picture right now. I'm not going to get political on you here, but I think the reality is that we have about five weeks of congressional action before we hit a fiscal cliff. In January, we're going to be faced, unless some things change, with a condition called sequestration in Washington, which is a series of automatic budget cuts up to about 10% for defense spending that have come out of the super committee that was uh, formed just uh, this past year uh, that failed to, to reach any kind of budget adjustments that would impact the nation. If we see 10% cuts in defense automatically and if we see non-defense cuts of about 8%, that is going to have some impact on that 25% of our revenue structure that comes in through our very, very successful faculty and student staff activities and grants and contracts. So not only do I want to say thank you for the competitiveness that you bring to this university and the success that you have in grant and contract competition, but all of us need to watch very carefully what's going to happen to the nation in January as to whether or not automatic cuts click in, kick in, and we have to anticipate a certain reduction in that 25% of our revenue that is generated through grant and contract activity. So this is just a heads up. This is a challenge that will hit us um, possibly uh, in January. As I move into the legislative session, I think we're facing a very challenging, but I am very optimistic about this coming legislative session starting in January of uh, 2013. Uh, I won't go through every single bit of this, but I think there are several things that you would appreciate knowing as part of this uh, afternoon. The University of North Dakota will be asking for about 18 and a quarter million dollars just as base budget additions going forward. This, we could say this is the cost to continue, plus the additional costs of adding in certain new programs that meet state priorities. Some of those programs have to do with our Bachelors of Science in Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering, and about $10 million of it, if, if appropriated, will be used for our College of Engineering and Mines initiative over in the western part of the state. So you can see that we have modest plans to enhance the academic programs of the university as it meets the needs of the state. There will be some concession to our system that has to do with security and emergency preparedness. Some of those positions, at least one, will land here at the University of North Dakota. We're also requesting funding to enhance our statewide nursing consortium. There are several capital construction priorities that we'll be arguing for as we go into the session. These have been approved by the State Board of Higher Education. And again, I am optimistic that we're going to have a receptive legislature for these. We have a compelling story behind each one. We are expanding quite extensively the School of Medicine and Health Sciences, and if appropriated, it may even result in an entire new building, which will permit the university to repurpose the existing St. Mike's Hospital for other needed programs here on this campus. We're also asking for state support to enhance and renovate and add a bit of square footage to our law school. Those are the two principal capital construction initiatives that will require appropriation. We're also going to be uh, asking for permission to uh, submit revenue bonds to enhance our student housing opportunities. And we will look for some reauthorization that is necessary for expanding the College of Business and Public Administration and our indoor practice facility, which we are raising money towards for both of those projects. As we raise money for capital construction, one of the initiatives that we have begun talking with through our state board and all the way up through the executive branch and with many of the uh, representatives and senators in the legislative branch has to do with a public-private partnership to match philanthropic dollars at the university. 
Many states have legislative appropriations that match one for one, two to one, any philanthropic dollar coming into the university, either for capital construction, student support, faculty support, or programmatic support. And one of our principal initiatives uh, coming into the legislative session will be seeking a, a state match for philanthropic dollars contributed into the institutions of the North Dakota University system. Finally, regarding the legislature, we're going to be facing uh, some element or some shape, some form of new funding models coming into uh, this university for our revenues through state appropriation. The executive branch has appointed a task force which has been active through the interim that has recently come up with a recommendation that will come from the governor that will fund institutions based on adjusted, completed student credit hours. So as our students come into our university, we're going to be taking a look at whether or not 12 versus some other number, 15, would be a full load, anticipating the fact that <clears throat> some function of our funding model may have to do with completed adjusted student credit hours. The legislative branch during the interim has been working on a slightly different model that addresses institutional outcomes or performance within the institution. And there, some five to another percentage of our revenues appropriated from the state could be based around the number of students that we graduate, the time to degree completion, the number of students that accomplish some particular goal valuable to the state, performance metrics around the performance of the institutions. So I would urge that you pay attention to the conversations during the legislative session. And I would urge that early in December, you pay very close attention to the governor's address and his recommendations because you will be hearing more about these funding models going forward. Uh, this will become clearer to us as we work through the uh, executive recommendations into the legislative session, but this will impact that 25 or 24 percent of our revenue, operating revenues, that uh, are required for this university to go forward. On another matter, we have recently uh, completed the initial phase of inviting three finalists for the new provost and academic vice president position to campus. I received yesterday the recommendations from the uh, search committee. I want to commend Professor Machorek, Vice President Reeser, for an excellent job in conducting a very professional search for this absolutely critical position on our campus. Uh, tomorrow, I have a scheduled conversation with one of the three candidates, and I hope that we will be able to uh, announce in fairly short order uh, the culmination of that search for the provost position. We also today have on our campus two consultants uh, advising a number of individuals and providing a report to the Diversity Council on how we will structure a new position uh, in diversity. And we have multiple opportunities there. This is still very much a work in progress, but we are making very good headway on deciding on how we are going to uh, implement the recommendations of the uh, Diversity Advisory Council. Next year, we're going to be visited by the Higher Learning Commission for our university accreditation. I can't possibly thank everyone enough who has worked on these committees for the five criteria. Uh, an executive committee has been providing oversight. This is our provost, uh, Paul LaBelle, uh, Joan Hawthorne, Steve Light, Pat O'Neill, Donna Pearson have been working, making sure that all of the self-study documents come together in a timely fashion so that we can assure institutional accreditation in 2013. Finally, let me just conclude by talking a little bit about philanthropy and how philanthropy uh, impacts this university as we achieve these exceptional goals. I just told you in some detail about our efforts to secure a state match, every philanthropic dollar matched by a state dollar. We've already talked about how this center, this building that we're in right now, is achieving the goals in sustainability that Mr. and Mrs. Gransberg wanted for this university and for this building. So our commitment through philanthropy to the goals of our students, our faculty, and our staff is an exceedingly important one. Recently, we received $10 million from Continental Oil, five of which came from Harold Hamm, five from the industry, 
and another four, which was a competitive grant application from the uh, Industrial Commission, for a total of $14 million to go into the new Harold Ham School of Geology and Geological Engineering. That's going to be a seminal building block upon which we can enhance the role of this university in geology, the geological sciences, some of the earth sciences, and especially how we can continue to partner with our industry, generating some of the wealth that this university will be assigned to achieve its goals and aspirations. So let me show you, if you didn't get a chance to go to the uh, special news conference that we had when Mr. Ham gave us the gift. Let me show you a little bit of that video just to give you a sense of how important this is for UND. Today we are jointly announcing a $14 million gift to the University of North Dakota in private public partnership. Our mission very simply is to serve our students and to serve the state of North Dakota. The Harold Ham School of Geology and Geological Engineering. It's the bringing together private sector with a great capability in higher education and research. You know, here we are today, uh, finally celebrating this uh, milestone. It's uh, it's wonderful. It's bigger and it's better than I first envisioned. This generous funding will give students at UND access to technology and resources that will better prepare them for engineering and energy related jobs here in North Dakota and all the way around the world. A great way to develop our students and our resource in this state. It adds value to the UND programs and it gives us a lot more insight into the geology and assist the private sector in their ability to invest more in our state, our resource, and our nation. It will enable us to begin enhancing or enriching the educational and research experience for our students and our faculty right away. Something practical, something that you could use, something that you could take with you. So I thought maybe a UND hard hat. <laughs> What we have is the opportunity to create an incredibly productive, dynamic program in geology and geological engineering. Training the particular disciplines that this will train is going to be especially helpful. It is our hope that this is only the beginning of what we can do partnering with private industry to educate our future workforce. Entering into these partnerships will help us develop exceptional tools, technologies, facilities. These partnerships will help us educate and prepare our students, and they will enable us to conduct meaningful research. Investing in our students means investing in our future. One of the best decisions we could possibly make. I have never seen Dean Alrawini so excited. <laughs> I understand he's still kind of gravitating about this far off the chair behind his desk. Let me conclude with um, the following. Not to state the obvious, but I, I do think that it's very, very clear, at least I hope it's as clear to all of you as it is to me, that UND is just a very vibrant, diverse, complex, challenging university. It derives its vitality from its faculty, its staff, and its students. It's a contemporary, large research university with the heart and soul of a liberal arts college. It values the challenges inherent in effective teaching, the challenges of advancing knowledge through research, scholarship, and creative works. And this university clearly values collegiality and collaboration. Now to end on somewhat of a philosophical note, I want to assure you that this university will continue to commit resources across the programs of the university, the liberal arts, sciences, humanities, professional programs, Specifically, the liberal arts, sciences, humanities, these are the foundations 
that produce educated individuals. Yes, we prepare workforce. We prepare people to enter the professions and other businesses. But we also educate the individual. In that regard, UND is preparing our students for leadership in a very increasing complex world. It's important that our students leave our institution with ability to think critically, communicate effectively, solve problems. I firmly believe that currency and these skills are so fundamental to uh, the success of our students and our university, virtually every way that we contribute to our society. I do not understand how an individual cannot understand the theological background in the Middle East and the conflicts that we see there. I don't understand how an individual can come out of the University of North Dakota and even begin to grasp the complexities of the economic markets in Europe if they don't have a solid foundation in the liberal arts. So I will add for uh, every successful career that we see in our professional foundations, our responsibility as faculty and staff to our students is to prepare them in these fundamental skills in the finest way possible. So finally, thanks. This is quite an adventure that we're all on, uh, guiding the University of North Dakota into truly exceptional standing. Um, I thank you for the opportunity of working with you as uh, president, and I know that together we're going to continue to shape an exceptional university. Thank you for this afternoon. <clears throat>
from the Department of Political Science, now the chair. Uh, with the gracious aid of, uh, of Provost LaBelle, we were able to, uh, to scrounge nowhere near enough money uh, so, that, uh, so that part of uh, Professor Sum's summer could be spent trying to bring together all the different parts. The faculty handbook just keeps on getting added to because there's a new policy that's added by the state board and, and other agencies, and we just add it in. We just add it in. And uh, Professor Sum did an incredible amount of work this summer and brought, came together with a, a plan of action. And now at the Senate level, uh, we have now come together with a, an overall plan about how we're going to how do I put it, uh, basically enact some of the changes and some of the streamlining that Professor Sum has outlined for us. And the upcoming Senate meeting, we actually are going to be asking uh, for approval for the creation of a new standing committee. We never want to be in this position again, folks, where you have to do eight years worth of updating. This is going to be a regular standing committee. Uh, the first year group, uh, whoever's going to be on it, I apologize now, you have a lot of work. But fortunately, Professor Sum did a lot of the background work for you. We've also been involved in some more prosaic sorts of things in some ways. Um, one of the things that, that I really hope that we can do as a Senate, and I know that Kurt Stoffren was very, very big on this as well, was that we can be a facilitator for a lot of the things that go on on campus. Um, we don't want the Senate to sort of find out about things after the fact. We want to be heavily involved, and the President, the provost and several other agencies on campus have sort of taken us at our word and have said, okay, how would you like to host this? How would you like to facilitate this? So some of you may recall uh, a number of months back, we were all, sh no, I was going to say shaking our boots, that would be so incorrect. We were so energized by the efficiencies memo that came out <clears throat> and how we were going to handle all of this. And of course, one of the things was uh, potential huge changes in learning management systems. And so the Senate uh, hosted a, a faculty meeting and a webinar, uh, once again through the agency of SILT. They, they save us all the time by, by the work that they do. Um, now, as it turns out, this has been superseded by a, by a new set of proposals coming from the chancellor's office. But this was something that, that the Senate wanted to be involved with. Also, uh, when President Brecky's office was looking at uh, redefining the way in which security and policing were, were being handled on campus. Um, the University Senate hosted uh, another gathering uh, of faculty with the LEMAP consultant. We want to be involved in every aspect of life on this campus. Um, it's also the case that Senate leadership has been heavily involved in the search for the new provost, uh, the possible redefinition of the functions and responsibilities of the AEO office, and also gathering campus-wide feedback on the proposals that first came out, uh, the first set of proposals from Chancellor Shivani. Um, and I hope, and indeed I was very much encouraged by the fact that the President wanted to get this much faculty feedback, and oh my goodness, did we get feedback from faculty, from staff, and even a few students. Uh, and I was forwarding it all on to President Kelly and to Vice President Walton. Um, of course, we also have the regular business. The annual reports of nine of the Senate's standing committees have been received and accepted between May and now. And I'm about to sigh as I say this. The intellectual property policy passed yet again uh, after another round of revisions at the October meeting. And I would simply like to point out, for those of you who did not have the privilege of being at that October meeting, it was a wonderful exercise in democracy. And I, I would like to say that fun was had by all, and I have to tip my hat to the student uh, members of the Senate, because I think that in September, they taught us a lot about parliamentary procedure, and boy, have I learned my Sturgis. Uh, but actually, I think it was an incredibly positive experience, and I hope that we have, I think that we're ending up with a really positive set of relationships throughout Senate, and it was, it was a, great, a great experience. Also, uh, conflict of interest policy was passed. Now, it had to be changed because, of course, there was change over the summer because there was change in federal policy. And so, so no one is worried. There is an interim policy safe and sound in place. Uh, but once again, it, uh, the president has asked the larger policy to go back to committee to be reviewed so it can be brought to Senate again. There have also been changes made to the special review committee pool, the charge. This was passed at our last meeting. It's also the case that the Senate executive, the Senate Ta, ta, ta. The Senate Continuing Education Committee 
is in the process of redefining its very work and mandate because of changes in jurisdiction, changes in, in university offices, but also changes in the way in which online courses are being offered. And uh, I, I'm being copied on everything that they're doing, and this committee is doing incredible work as they are revisioning the way that we might actually approach this. Uh, it's really wonderful to watch. Also, a tip of the hat to the Office of General Counsel, uh, an update to the 612 grievance procedure has been accepted now by the uh, Senate Executive Committee and is coming before the Senate uh, at our meeting on Thursday. Um, and the SEC is also doing something that I think is long overdue. Uh, we already gave notice to the Senate that we are asking uh, to have a bylaw change made at the upcoming meeting of the Senate so that we will actually be able to have a staff representative on the Senate Executive Committee. This has been a long time in coming, uh, and I look forward to, uh, to this expansion, and I'm sure that my colleagues on Senate are going to support this. I'm really, really hoping. Uh, overall, uh, you can see from the last point up there that I think more than anything else what this Senate, and it's been a very active Senate, um, is really working towards developing a greater sense of shared governance. It's been a great group to work with, and I think we're just beginning to handle a number of these questions. Um, we have miles to go before we sleep. There's an awful lot of work to be done. But I think that we've started to make a great step in, the, in that direction. I think it's been a true tribute to the President and to the Provost that they have involved the Senate and the Senate leadership. Right now, yes, it's true, it seems it's more the Senate leadership, but it has to start somewhere and we're working through changing the entire culture. One of the things that, that we are hoping to do is to attract more people into shared governance. And let me just, it's not on the PowerPoint, but let me just pick up on something that, that President Kelly had talked about. Um, of course, the, the, the groups working on the Higher Learning Commission self-studies, they're not Senate committees. But as I look around the room, and I consider the people who I know who are on Senate, who are also serving on the Higher Learning Commission study groups. Uh, I'm not saying this is a completely synonymous group, but awful lot of overlap. What we see are people dedicated to what some folks may refer to as service, but really is shared governance in the finest sense of that word, collaborative governance. We work at the sort of institution, those of us who are lucky enough to work at universities, we actually do have a say in the way things get done. But unless we all take the chance and take the opportunity to perform that work and to step up, and unless those of us who are a little <clears throat> older um, make sure that we step aside to let the newer folks develop as leaders, uh, then we're not gonna be able to keep on going in this way. And so it's my profound hope that we started a positive movement in this way. And I am really looking forward to uh, being able to step aside at the end of this year for that next generation of leaders. And uh, Ryan is, is nodding his head, no. Uh, I just want to close my comments. I promise it wouldn't be too long. Uh, I have so many thanks to give, so I, I have a list. I didn't want to forget anyone. I have to thank Ryan Zur, who, is, who graciously agreed to uh, serve as the Senate Vice Chair, which means that he is the chair-elect. Kurt Stauffrin, um, thank you was not enough for all the work that Kurt has done and continues to do. Uh, he is so heavily involved in so many of these projects. Um, Kim Kendall, who uh, last year and this year has served as, the, as faculty representative. Paul LaBelle, uh, our provost. Of course, the provost sits on the Senate Executive Committee and his voice is important. And, uh, and I'm actually gonna really miss him when he's no longer uh, on that committee. Logan Fletcher. Uh, Logan and I have gotten to know each other quite well. We were joking the other day. It's like, gee, we only get to see each other three or four times a week now because uh, we also served on a search committee and several other things together. Uh, Doug Munsky, who all of you in this room know, uh, who is the Council of College Faculty Representative, none of the work of Senate would ever get done without Suzanne Anderson. Uh, her expertise, her kindness, um, and just actually being a mensch is always wonderful but the list goes on. Kathy Smart, because of course I'm doing a transition. It's not just from this year. Kathy Smart, who was the, the, the past chair of the Senate. Roseanne McBride did yeoman work on the Senate executive. Don Puchigan, who's in the room today, uh, the Council of College faculty representative last year. Kylie Overson, 
uh, the, the student body president from last year. It was delightful working with her and getting to know her. But the final thanks, I have to thank Lori Hofflin, who is always keeps everyone on Senate on track, uh, does a remarkable job. President Kelly, for all the work that he's done and all the support that he's given to those of us who want to improve the nature of shared governance on campus. Of course, members of the University Senate. But I do want to draw your attention to this somewhat staggering number of people. Now, these are just the University Senate committees. There are over 150 people. And let me remind you, our Senate is not a faculty Senate. Our Senate is a University Senate. So we have students, we have staff, and we have dedicated faculty doing an incredible amount of work. And as those of you who've been involved in this, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, uh, but for those of you folks who've been involved in this work, you know how much work it takes. The real work of the Senate is done in those committees and those subcommittees. And I just have to thank everyone who was so heavily involved with that. And that's it. I promised you a sh short show. So unless there are any matters arising, and hearing none, I declare this meeting of the University Council closed. Thank you very much.